Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to take your calls at 866 594 4150. 866 594 4150. We got a call that uh, was coming in there while the music was playing, and Michelle's been waiting. So let's get right to Michelle and see if we can help her out. Michelle, you're on the under the hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. Morning. Uh, we purchased a vehicle through a local auto auction, and normally we have somebody take a look at them, but this one nobody had a chance to take a look at, and there is mold all over the upholstery in the front and the back. And I was wondering what the best product or the best course of action would be to get rid of that mold. Well, let's, uh, let's unpack this a little bit and see what we got going on here. Before we talk about helping out to get rid of the mold that's in there, why Shannon, is it there? What is typically the cause of Yeah, no, of I'm just mold. trying to figure out why. Do you know, you guys find any reason why, without us guessing, there's mold in there? We could probably guess. Uh, I don't know why it's there. We could just see it and it smells really bad. Mm. What kind of mold is it? Is it like the, just like, what are you seeing? It's like kind of spotted mold. It's like, uh, I don't know if you set a piece of bread out too long. <laughs> it's got uh, like spotted Kind of yeah, brownish. I don't know. What what kind? What That's kind hard of, to describe. I, what kind of vehicle is it? It's a 2018 Mitsubishi Outlander Sport. Okay. Is it just on the the upholstery, or is it is there some on the dash too, on the plastic parts of the car? Um, mostly on the upholstery, but where it was worse on the upholstery, there's a little bit on the plastic pieces. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we've taken those off and washed them and and put them in bleach water or whatever and i'm not sure what like i said i'm not sure what the best course of action is most of it is on the upholstery though there was very little on the plastic part okay so at some point this vehicle's had a bunch of moisture in it and you know it, I, there's there's times where i know i was just talking to a guy yesterday we were sitting down having lunch and he was talking about he's got about 15 20 vehicles stored in a really tight space and he's never had good climate control and there was a number of them that when he would open them up there was literally moisture inside of the vehicles mm-hmm. because he didn't have a dehumidifier run. He didn't have air conditioning. And so it would build up a high amount of moisture. Now, when I hear about this being a Mitsubishi Outlander, I do get a bit nervous about the source of the moisture, uh, you know, where it might be coming from. Is it, is it a car that's been in a, 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 an event that it's had um, been in a flood at some point? Is it a car that had, like Russ is pointing up at the ceiling, I think he's talking about get a halo, but otherwise was the sunroof left open? Both. And, it, and yeah. it, got, it got wet inside or at does some point. Or are the drains clogged because yeah. we want you to clean the drains out if it does have a sunroof. we no. got to find the source of this problem. And is it still wet under the carpet? Yeah. we got to find the source there of is no, There is no sunroof on the car. Okay. okay. And is have you reached up under the carpet, like where your driver's feet go, to see if it's still wet under there? <clears throat> My husband pulled all of that stuff out, um, um, completely removed everything from the inside of the sure. car. And there was... Um, some moisture underneath it. Well, it wasn't moisture. It was actually just mold. Like I said, it came from an auto auction, and so I don't know. When we got the vehicle, there was no, it wasn't like, there wasn't condensation on the inside of the windows or anything, so I don't know how long it had been there. Well, that's that's good then, because if it runs and drives really well, you shouldn't, I'm not going to worry a whole lot about problems that are there today. If it's dry under there, but there's some signs of mold, that's going to come from one of two places. The moisture got in there, either because it was in a really snowy climate and it got a lot of snow on the feet in there, which does happen, and then it that was, would take a lot of snow foot melt. And then to it was parked and, and closed. Yeah. Uh, or it's been driven through uh, enough water to get inside. It doesn't have to be necessarily a flood, you know, quote flood car, but it could have enough water that it got above the floor pans or it could have had even a drain open on the floor and if it was just touching the floor pan it could come in you you want to check those sources and as you go down the line if you start having any weird electrical noises then or you know issues then you may have to do some further checking but at this point if it's all dry and let's just assume the water's gone and it's not going to come back then to clean that bleach tends to turn 
mold, it, it cha- changes the color of it so you don't see it, but the mold still stays there. Good old soap and water does a great job of cleaning off mold. Um, a scrub brush, not, not too heavy that you damage the upholstery, but just a scrub brush and soap and water, even dish soap and water like, you know, like Dawn or anything like that, and a shop vac is great. You're going to get it a little damp. You don't want to get it flooded, but a lot of times people will just put get a rag soaked in water, wring it out pretty good but not completely dry, scrub the seat, then shop vac it to take all the mold spores out. And you're going to have to do that a couple times because you've got the mold spores left behind that will continue to grow. And once you get all that cleaned out, uh, you'll still have a little bit of that smell in there. And you could use something like our partner Liquamolly, their interior cleaner. It's meant to be sprayed on, let's sit about five minutes, and then wiped off dry. That can go on the plastic as well as the upholstery. Uh, you know, I've seen people use other cleaners like Febreze, and, and I personally can't stand the that smell that it leaves behind, even though the other smell's gone. It's just pretty strong. I used yeah. it in Shannon's when he had the mice in the, <laughs> in the air, and it smelled like, Whoa. What One of the things that will, if the car ends up having an odor that just doesn't go away, I would suggest, and it might cost a little bit of money, maybe you get lucky and find a, a, a recycled original equipment used one that's in good shape yet that hasn't been out in the weather, because a lot of times if you get it from salvage, you know, the carpet is not something that is, unless it's pulled out right away in the dismantling process, it's not often kept clean. Um, but you might consider and find out how much a carpet costs from Mitsubishi just to replace that entire carpet if you know that's been wet. Because that that sound barriers and stuff in there, it just holds a lot of odor and things. So to me, that is a if you still got a smell in there, that might be the extreme measure you have to go to is to spend a little money and replace the carpet if it doesn't go away. Because that, that's the one that will hold the most odor, it seems like. Oh, okay, well, that's good to know because um, we took the carpet out and he, we actually did clean it with Dawn dish soap and a pressure washer. And that carpet seems to be fine, but it's the seats that we, we haven't got to those yet, but those are where the most smell is coming from. Yeah, you got to just keep digging. I, I, I once fixed a vehicle. My wife drove it for two years and then she had an accident uh, and then it got wrecked. But uh, it had been in a major water event. Was it the prelude? It was the prelude. Score. Yeah, and it would it went into a ditch on a on a rainy day, and the 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 runoff water that was running into and through the car was from a cattle yard, <laughs> and uh, it, it was it was something that myself and and Bruce and Kevin Wenzel from Joe and Sons we we had that interior out, and there was a lot of washing, drying, washing, drying, washing, drying. It was a, quite a process to the point where. We, we cleaned it up, but it was it was a project. And I would say when you're all done and you get it all finished, have someone come in who's never sat in the car for two reasons. One, you might be nose blind to it and st- not be able to smell it, but also just the opposite. You might never get that smell out exactly. of your brain. But don't tell them. Right. Don't just, tell them you're asking to test anything. Hey, what do you think of my say, car? Or you can even just go, to the, does it? do you smell anything funny in here? Yep. And then they'll to let you know that either you did get it or you didn't get it. My <laughs> wife's car, we call it the Fisher Price car. We joke every time we open the door, it would be like that barn. Brr, <laughs> brr. <laughs> We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866 594 4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150 from the autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go back to the phones and talk to Monica. Monica, you are on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you, Monica? Well, I've got a 2014 Nissan Murano. And recently it has acted like it, well, I shouldn't say acted, but when I'm driving it, it's almost like you can feel a little pull, like the brake, you know, is going on. And then we noticed when we were on the interstate that if I have the cruise control on, all of a sudden that'll happen. And it'll kick my cruise off. I'll lose, you know, like power, kind of. And then it takes a few minutes for me to build back my speed back up. Interesting d- description. The click in the cruise off is a big <laughs> clue, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a big... I, I was expecting a different problem as you were starting to talk, and then as you said what you were talking, I'm like, this sounds different. So when the cruise control goes off, 
Um, do you, is your cruise? Do you have a cruise light uh, on the dash that says when your cruise cruise is powered yeah. on? Does that yep. go, does that yeah, go it's away? Like, yeah, it's like it's like I'm kicking it. You know, like when you hit your brake, you know, to take your cruise off. It's as if I hit the brake, even though I didn't. In my car, there's a light that goes on when I turn on the cruise, and then there's another light that goes right. on when it's set. Does the cruise set light come off, but the cruise on light stays on? Do you have that? No, it completely okay. comes off. Yeah, I have it. Okay. But it, it it does the same thing as if I'm driving it and I hit the brake because I want my cruise to just be off. I don't get. I mean, the, it I don't get the pulling. That's what I'm trying to figure out how that's all correlated. The like, is it a hard? Well, like, is it a hard pull? You, or? Do you mean a pull to the side, or just it feels like the brakes are applying? Great. It feels like the brakes yeah. are being applied. Not a pull left or right, just uh, a, okay. a, a strain. No. Yeah, okay. No. All right. Right. All right. I'm, I'm and, in on and, this and, one. And I, <laughs> and I felt it in town, too, when I don't have the cruise on. And, you know, it's just, it's just like, I say pull, but, yeah, it's, it's like it breaks a little bit. Automatic. Does this vehicle have automatic braking on it? Well, I would imagine. I'm, I'm I mean, guessing. Have you I don't ever know. noticed what do you mean, you... automatic braking? Well, the, so automatic braking, they started putting it in around 14 on a lot of stuff. Oh, you, no. You know, you get up too close to I a car. I don't believe it's... it does. Okay. Because that no, would make a big it difference. Doesn't, but, well, and, and it's funny you said that because that's exactly what I was telling my coworkers. I, you know, I've had this car for a few years and I said, it's just like all of a sudden it's got this feature that I don't know about, you know, but it, it doesn't. Okay, good, because there are some people that don't know that a car has it, and we've had, and then the ones that do know it has it, we've had people that have had windshields put in or mirrors broken on the outside and replaced, and they weren't calibrated correctly, and they cause all sorts of problems like we gotta this. we got to get a handle on that, don't we? We have to standardize that stuff so even used car dealers know what's there. Exactly. These what options, to show people. Yeah, these yeah. options that are new get forgotten about as the cars get passed along i'm wondering if there's just something in there that's shutting the cruise off so it feels like the brakes are on because it's slowing down but when she says it you know does it when Monica's the cruise is doing it on. when the cruise is not on and it's slowing well, down well now when this this last time that it happened we, well we haven't taken it on the interstate since but we were on our way back from the black hill i was driving and it happened and i thought well that's really crazy and, and it it took a long time for me to get back up to my speed and my husband was in the passenger seat, and he Googled it, and actually something came up that Nissan knows about a problem, about this braking. Um, but we took it in um, and had it checked, and they didn't know any. They they didn't know anything about what what my husband had Googled or anything. They just think we need a new transmission, and that's what I want to. Well, kind of well, I, I was going to go there. Because yeah. we're, we're CV- trying to go somewhere else first <laughs> with that CVT that's in there. I was, Please. yeah, I was going to try to stay away from that too. But, but a lot of times you can find whatever you want on Google. Exactly. If we've noticed when we're trying to look for something, we'll we can find right. somebody that's got something similar. But real quickly, let me jump in there because this happened to a friend of mine recently. Where a friend the when you look something up and you read about it and you see in this this is a perfect example of it, Monica. Someone will post and say, I took it to Nissan, the dealer, and the guy I talked So Nissan knows about the problem. Whereas what it might actually be is one guy on the internet brought it into a place where they have the one guy who just went, oh, I know what that is. It's right. this. So to the, the person who's posting on Facebook, they think Nissan understands the problem and that they're hiding it. It could just be mm-hmm. a guy It just Nissan. might be a guy that figured out your yeah. problem. If there's so, not a technical service bolt and there's right. some sort of a... Of, of a messaging out to the dealers, they may not know and about which, it. Which there might be. I'm not, if it I'm is, not saying this isn't that case right. or is. If it is your car, it could be right. a different build date on your car too. So it can be, it could be a problem, but it could be separate. It's possible it's in the transmission. Now, if it is and it's in that CVT transmission, it will get worse. They never fix themselves. So <laughs> you would be able to experience this more and more until finally Every time you turn the cruise on, it's going to keep kicking out and it's going to give you a hard time. And there should be, so a, a person at a dealership or not at a dealership who is experienced with a scanner should be able to look at it and look into the cruise portion and it should tell the system what the last thing was that turned the cruise off. 
and it's great for diagnostic purposes. We use it all the time on many manufacturers. If somebody says my cruise shuts off sometimes, I look and I say, hmm, says it was the brake pedal. And if they say, nope, definitely wasn't pushing on the brake, I want to make sure that the brake pedal's tight and not hanging and bouncing on the switch. Then I want to go to the back and make sure if it's got trailer hitch wiring, it's not shorted and giving a false signal that the brakes are on because the brake lights are blinking back there or that I have a shorted taillight board. But if it says throttle position sensor or transmission range sensor, then I'm going to look a different direction. And that'll tell me, it'll give me a good guide as to what's going on. Russ, is this a code or a, something that's going to be in there stored as history, even if they don't have the problem occur? It'll be stored for a certain period, not forever. But if she just got back from a trip, it could store it for a few days. Because that that's be the, the way, time to look. It, it, does it do, could you replicate this on any given day? Oh, I'm sure. Because if the yeah, shop, I'm, I'm sure it's happening I, enough. That yeah, if, if, you, the, if the repair shop can replicate it, they could actually do it live and have somebody drive it and see why it's kicking it off. And did you say it does get the same sensation with the cruise off when you're just driving? You did, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. Well, that's what it, yeah. When I first noticed it was when I was driving in town, and that's, you know, where I made the joke that I had this function that I know that it doesn't have, but it was almost as if, I was getting close to a car, you know, and it breaks. How many miles you know, are on the car? Like what you guys were talking about. Uh, 88. All right. Well, here's here's what I think we need to do. You, you need to get this probably, I don't know, maybe she doesn't. Maybe she's just got to keep driving it. But if, okay, I was going to say two things at once. Here's the thing I really want to say. If, if you're driving with your foot pedal and something happens, and there, without even thinking about it, you can give the vehicle a little more gas or do something with the foot pedal to compensate for whatever just happened. And if you've driven a car long enough, you kind of do it just without even thinking about it. She has to really step on it to get right. up but, to speed again. But if a car has cruise control turned on and it gets a glitch that's quite minor in its system, or it's going to say, no, I can't drive you anymore. There's something not right here. Mm -hmm. And then it kicks it off, and it's more noticeable, and it's more pronounced at that point. because you, if, if you're even on a slight incline, yeah. you will – It'll freak you out. Yeah, so right. th that tells me. Oh, that, yeah. that tells me that, that, like Russ said, that computer is it's getting a signal saying, "I don't like this. I'm turning myself off," and that should be stored, and they should be able to find that why it's turning it off. And you use the cruise control as the remedy or the clue if you're in an escape room. That'd be one of your clues right. to figure out what's happening right. all the time. I was recently in an escape room, so just right. made me think of that. So. You got out. That's good. Eventually. <laughs> 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 but with, that with is, a lot of clues. <laughs> but with eighty eight thousand on a CVT Nissan, when she said she had eighty eight thousand, you reacted because that is it's Whoa. plausible. It's it puts plausible. so many transmissions in yeah. in vehicles overall and engines and stuff, rear ends. And uh, yeah. when you say this car at this vehicle, I've seen a lot of them right there. Is it going to get or worse? they go many miles? I mean, we've seen them with two hundred thousand, but we've also let's seen not freak her out too bad, but. Is we, this one where if if she doesn't get it fixed, oh, right it'll away, get it gets worse. worse and, but it it'll wreck more, or can no, she? No, it's okay. it's if a CVT is done, it's pretty much done. And in, in this case, but See, it's, she can it maybe could be, budget it, drive it for else. a few more weeks, months, and then it's always good to keep there. saving. Monica, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's talk to Tony. You're on the end of the hood show, Tony. What can we do for you? Oh, hey, I got a 69 Chevy pickup on the door. What I need to know is on the frame, is there a difference between a three-quarter ton and a half ton? There typically is. Um, on most all those models, they're going to have a larger channel frame on a three-quarter ton or a one ton than they do on the half ton. And I believe that was the case in that in that era. I, You know, we... Really got into fixing up trucks. My dad did, and I was a little kid following him around in that era, um, you know, fixing wrecked pickups and things like that. And I don't know ever that we were able to switch between a three-quarter ton and a half-ton frame uh, when we do some major repairs. They, I, I think that's the first thing I would do is measure the frame channel um, for the, the width of it um, and then the overlap on, the, on the, where it's bent and the C-channel. That that's uh, I'm quite confident they're different, but I've been wrong before on things like that. But that's what my my quick memory serves me up. Russ, does it sound like it would be interchangeable? I, 
as far as swapping the bodies, you could, I think, but I believe, yeah, Shannon's right on that. And, you know, I as recently as 10 years ago, I was doing that on my own on an older one. And I, I, yeah, I know the springs and everything are different on there, but I believe that frame was just a little bit heavier. Tony, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you follow us on Facebook and you join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Jen Wilson, who listens to us in Liberal, Kansas. Congratulations from all of us under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. You can find them at uti.edu. They'll get you trained when you want to get out and be an automotive technician. And here's the deal. I've been listening to some places that offer courses like business courses and things like that at their colleges. And a lot of them have been thinking about getting into an electric car course. Okay. And how does this fit in with UTI, Universal Technical Institute, Diasco? Well, I'm going to tell you. So these people are getting in because they said right out when I was listening to them, they said, well, we were kind of afraid to get into the internal combustion thing because there's just a lot of stuff there, which tells me they're not up to speed. They're not Universal Technical Institute. If you want to go someplace that's going to train you the right way, that has years and years of already well-rehearsed experience, it's Universal Technical Institute. They already have the connections. They're not going out trying to figure out how to develop a curriculum. They're way in front of it. So they're going to help you get what you need to get the job that you want at better pay with a, a better set of skills. Period. So Universal Technical Institute, UTI.edu. Check them out. 866-594-4150. Tony hung on. He wants to ask another question. Tony, go ahead. Oh, okay. Say if the frames are different, what about the upper or lower A-arm? Are they swappable? You can buy so much more stuff for half of them. You get a three-quarter ton. Well, the thing- as far as aftermarket goes, you know, like two-bitter A-arms? Yeah, I went, a- I went around the corner here in the break and... One of our guys, Charlie, has been in this business for a long, long time, and I asked him the same that question. That stuff is different for yeah, sure. Yeah, I asked him the same question about the frame because I just – something was tickling my brain saying I wasn't right on that answer. But he thought the frames were different also, and then I, I'm quite confident when you get into the control arms and the spindles, that's all going to be different. And you got to watch your year because some of them had – in the 67, 68, they had drum brakes, and then you get into your disc brakes, and then you know on the back end of the half tons, you had coil springs and leaf springs in between the years. So, you know, the, the, there's so much right. customized I'm stuff gonna, there for, I'm but that, I, over. Yeah, that, I don't think much of that half ton stuff works on the three quarter ton. Right. We, I'm going to go with disc brakes. Yeah, that Especially 100%. new spindles and everything. If you've got it stripped down, so you've got a three quarter ton two wheel drive, right? Correct. Okay. If you have that, I would look close. I. You know, if I, like on mine, when I had it apart, I just made everything the way I wanted to with the frame. It was a four-wheel drive, but I just did it the way I wanted to. And you can. So if you've got a 69 and you're restoring it, once you get that frame stripped down, you can get your half-ton stuff and look at it and get on some of the half, the forums for these trucks and see what other people have done. But I would bet you could, you know, a lot of people try to go heavier. They take these half-tons and they want to put the three-quarter-ton springs on it, and then you get a weak frame. But you've got a pretty strong frame already, which is great if you're going to be driving this thing hard and twisting and all that. So, uh, But nowhere near the strength of the new three-quarter-ton trucks would be. So you should be able to put lighter springs on the rear of it, you know, half-ton springs so it's a little lower, your smaller rear end under it. I mean, that's where you come to a big change. You're changing all your brakes anyway, so when you do that, you don't have to worry about because the lines are all different between a three-quarter and a half. But I, I bet you could you could switch if you're out. Doing, if you're doing everything yeah. as a kit. Take some measurements on that front end where the control arms mount to the frame. You may be able to swap them. And you may call a company like Ride Tech. You know, we used to use back in the day with our Nordstrom's Factory Performance. And there was other ones that we used that they're going to know that right away. If you tell them, you know, I'm doing this kit, uh, you know, I want to s- switch all this over. I bet you when you get a hold of one of their specialists, they're going to know exa- exactly oh, yeah. what 
can be put on complete right. as as a, a kit. Because when you look at these build shows and things like that, you, Russ, you're right. They oftentimes will replace that whole setup together. And if the if the mounting point on the frame is the same width, it, it there's a good chance that it could work as a complete deal. If you dream it, you can do it. We took a 49 GMC grain truck that was 20 some feet long and swapped out the rear suspension in it without any welding. It was all bolt on for that. And in the front, we took all that three quarter ton stuff out and put half ton on it. That took a little welding, but it was already a part. If you're down to a bare frame, mark out what you want, get a welding shop involved, put some brackets on, make it. Sounds, Dream it, build it. Sounds neat. <laughs> sounds like a lot of work. I got Tony. a welding shop myself, so. Perfect. Oh, that's even better, yeah. Tony, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Let us know how it goes. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Jay. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Jay, what can we do for you? I got a 2010 GMC Yukon. I've got the service stability track, service trailer brake, and service traction control lights on. And I can't figure out which item to start with first. Well, the thing that we will tell you quickly is that this is the good news. They could all be related to one problem. And so okay. that system that is involved, you're, you're talking about stability track, analog brakes, um, all the traction control. They all have to do with the sensors on the wheels. They all have to do with okay. a, you could have a sensor on the bottom of your steering column that's bad, a yaw sensor or something like that. It could be even a case where the throttle valve is starting to have a problem and it can't get the consistent signal from the throttle. So it says, oh, I can't control the things I need to control. So I got to put this light on. Russ, where do you start with something like that when it comes in the shop? We plug our scanner into it and start looking to see if we've got any codes in the system other than the brakes, because a lot of times the only thing you're going to find in your brakes is a code that says invalid serial data received, which is going to give you all those lights and all those problems. Invalid data means just what Shannon said. There is invalid data coming from another sensor. So that's when we're going to look at other systems to see if they're causing a problem with this system. One of the most common things we see on this, probably... Nine out of ten, compared to everything else, is either a problem with the throttle body or the engine computer. Sometimes both. Because that throttle body with that big electric motor that's run by the engine computer, if it shorts, it, a lot of times it smokes those drivers in that engine computer. We see that a lot compared to the, you know, one out of every ten times it's a wheel speed sensor or a yaw rate sensor or an accelerometer or something like that or an ABS module. But we're going to want to look at all codes. When we plug a scanner in, we do something called an all code scan. It reads every system in the vehicle at once. Whereas the typical scanner you're going to find in an auto parts store, they're just going to look at brakes or they're going to look at engines. They may not even look at the engine if they're reading brake codes, if they even do that, because not all auto parts stores will read anything other than your generic OBD2 engine codes. So you'll want something that scans a little more than that. And those scanners are available to the general public Pretty cheap. Chris has got one I gave to him. Shannon's got one. I don't know. You may have bought one, and I think I gave you one too. But those units were both like 99 bucks available at pretty much every auto parts store. And that was back before everything got cheaper. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some now, of them were $39.95, yeah. $29.95. And then they just hook to your phone by Bluetooth. That's plug the kind it in, I have. It works really slick. Mm -hmm. Scan, and some of them will give you a world of information for just another, you know, 29 bucks a year or so, depending on what you're looking for. But I think you could get some pretty basic information with a cheaper one. That help you out there, Jay? You bet. Sounds like I'm bringing it to uh, a shop. You guys to have a look, <laughs> you look at it. All yep. right. Thanks very much for the call, Jay. Yeah, that was uh, so much stuff has gotten so much cheaper than it was. And we'll see what happens with the chip shortage because it's affecting everything. But that, the, the, $99, that was, you know, six, seven years ago. Now, though, that level of reader's way lower. I think we're going to see a jump. When you mentioned chip shortage, we were talking a couple weeks ago, Shannon, about the, the, the one of the reasons for the chip shortage is the chip companies don't want to build 
the old chip. Well, they had already switched over during the pandemic to right. other stuff. <laughs> but the man, a lot of manufacturers, including people who make the little handheld scanners and stuff, they're not geared up and using the current level, that next generation of chips. So if you've got a company that says, well, okay, we'll just we'll just build a, you know, a billion chips so you can put them in all your stuff. And then those manufacturers say, oh, well, we were slow, so we switched over. We don't want those. Why would they do that? Why would they want to build the old stuff if they still got the new ones? And apparently they've got a lot of new ones. So we could see some really cool leaps in technology, Chris. And, and yeah, it, no, I think, I think you're onto something. And then, you know, you couple the chip shortage on electronic stuff, and then you couple that with all the ships that are floating around in the ocean out on the West Coast mm-hmm. that they can't get unloaded. Yep. Some of the statistics, when you start hearing the numbers of containers that are, it's not just the ones sitting on the ships, it's the ones that are in the port that they can't get the trucks to take them out. Right. Is, you know, so there's, it, it's, a, it's a big mess. We, we, uh, <laughs> you may not get a Barbie for Christmas. <laughs> at our own shop, we struggled trying to figure, or not, not so much with actually having less employees, but with why. So, you know, I've always got to find out why, why, why. So I started asking questions. And one of the things that recently came up more than anything else is Russ is going to be disappeared soon. Yeah. Who's quite, don't yep. be careful who you're asking questions. You know, talking to a lot of people that come in that I knew used to say, Oh, you know what? I don't know when I can pick up my car, or drop it off. You know, we'll have to figure out a time because I work, I got to go to my second job. I'm like, so I had a few people say, oh, I just got one job now. And I thought, wait a second. I said, oh, you don't work three jobs anymore? No, I found out during the pandemic that I didn't need to work three jobs. So I kind of enjoyed myself. I get to stay home with my kids and my family, my husband, wife, whatever. So I'm just working one now. So we have got quite a few people that are our customers that are now working one job. So we wonder where the people went. The people didn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. They're just not working three jobs or two jobs. They just De- decided definitely to Definitely some on. of that going on. So good for them, and the rest of us will have to figure it out if that's the case. I'm, I'm glad they weren't sitting at home just not working. They just chose, hey, if you want to work one full-time job, more If I don't go you. out two nights a week, I don't have to work three nights a week. But we'll, <laughs> we'll be having some discussions soon on the radio show, Chris, about, so if you look at the U.K., they were struggling oh, to yeah. get gasoline a couple weeks ago because they didn't have truck drivers. So they had the military enlisted to help them out and get some stuff, but now they've got other things, but we're starting to see an oil shortage in the United States of not petroleum motor oil, but the actual bottles of oil on our shelf to get the oil changed. So Chris, you don't have to worry about it because you do what? Every two years you change yours? If necessary. If necessary. Let's talk to Lisa. You're on the end of the hood show. Lisa, what can we do for you? Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Uh, I have a 2008 Toyota Corolla. And it has 185,000 miles on it. And about four years ago, it just all of a sudden would start, but then would start. So we took it to the Toyota dealer. They kept it for two or three weeks, trying to see if they could catch it when it wouldn't start and so on. And the only thing they could come up with, it was the security system, the wires behind the dash they took out. And they said they secured those and also coded us new keys. We went great for four years till this summer. And then all of a sudden, it's doing it again. So we took it to another Toyota dealer. They kept it for a month, five weeks, and couldn't seem to come up with anything. Decided maybe the lo- wires were loose again. Put in new spark plugs, and we could, went for about a week. No problems. Started up again. And they just gave up. They said they had no idea what it was. And so I drove it like a month. Fine, no problems. And now it's just randomly doing it again, like, this morning, I went out to start it up. It started up. I went out five minutes later, turned it over, and won't start. So we're just kind of a wit's end where to go with it. So we're going to help you. This is going to sound a little smart, Alec, but I'm, I'm not – yeah, I, I maybe do intend it. You've had this problem for eight years, and we're going to help you solve this on the radio show. <laughs> well, no, just four, like four years ago. But it's such Only a great four. car. I love it, and I don't want to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just like I, – I'm just trying everything. It just seems like – there should be some solution to it, or do I just dump it and so be done with it? It does turn over, but it doesn't start. Right, just randomly. Right. And go weak. when it had this other problem four years ago, it did exactly the same thing. It turned over, but didn't start, correct? Exactly. Has yep. it ever had a theft 
light or security light or a little picture of a lock on the dash when it was not starting. Yes, yes. It will flash there down below the dash, you know, that light and stuff. And I know when you take it out, it's supposed to flash. And then, um, you know, you put it back in and sometimes it'll still flash. And once that light goes off, that seems to be when it starts. So it seems to be something with that security. Good. That is that is a great a great diagnosis because if we know that that light is flashing when you're trying to start it and then it goes off and it starts, we definitely have a security issue. That can be from the key. It can be from the lock sick the lock cylinder in the dash that you're turning with the key uh, or the sensor there or with the security module. Any one of those can cause that problem. Wiring is pretty rare unless a rodent has gotten there. Yeah, mouse unless it's or something. been affected at some yeah. point by a flood or an animal or something. Yep. That'll do it. If not, uh, if it was my own personal car and I was fighting with this, it's almost impossible to figure out which one of those it is. And sometimes I pick up each one of those components from a certified auto recycler, like car dash part, and I just replace them all. Put them in, replace them, and know I've fixed it. Because I can say the one thing about those those Toyotas, it is extremely rare to have a security issue with them. So it's probably just a failed component. It's not like we see these every couple years right. or every once a year. It's like I think we may have seen one once ever in one of these. So, so getting that fixed... Should be the you may have to replace yeah. everything. In what the kind of programming system. would that require quickly? Program the engine, computer, and the theft module on it once and, it's replaced, and that can be done as far as you know. Should be able to. Okay, yeah. Lisa, thanks some. very much for the call. We're going to take a break. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. That's the number to reach us. We'll be back on the end of the hood show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go back to the phones and talk to Gary. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Gary, what can we do for you? Yeah, I've got a 2003 Ford Escape that my daughter used uh, to go back and forth to college. Okay, so when she got married, they brought the car back to us. It had a remote control start on it. Well, they had just put a new battery in it. And if you didn't start the car, like, uh, a couple times a week, it seemed like it would the battery wouldn't stay charged. Something was running it down. And I called the guy to put the remote control start in, and he said that that wouldn't pull enough amps to run that battery down. So it kept doing it. So I took the fuse out of the, of the remote control. didn't start anyway. It didn't work, and I just took the fuse out, and I took it to the, the guy that works on our cars all the time, and he run a, all kinds of tests on electric, and it, it uh, he couldn't find anything running it down. said the battery was good, everything was good. And so since I took that fuse out, it hadn't done that since then. Would that be a – could that pull enough amps to, to run the battery down? So any malfunctioning – electronic component, including a remote starter system, can cause a battery drain enough to run it down. In a normal operating state, no, they shouldn't. But when they fail, yes, they can. That remote start has the capability, when it is operating properly, to turn on your ignition and drain current, to send a signal out to crank the engine, and also to run your heater and your accessories. So if any of those were active, yes, it could pull the current down. But what they're telling you okay. is absolutely correct. If it is working properly, there's no way that it's going to run the battery down in two days. It just won't. But malfunctioning, yes. Same way with your car. If you've got an alternator in the car that charges fine when it's running, but you shut the car off and it continues to say the field stays engaged, it's going to run your battery dead even though... It shouldn't normally over a few days. So if you've taken those fuses out, you've made a great diagnosis on your own and essentially fixed the problem. If the starter didn't work anyways, just leave the fuses out of it and don't I'm, do anything with it. And I if you, might take it back to the, to, the, to the guy that put it in, the, the dealer, and let him just take the whole thing back off because I don't need it now anyway because 
I don't use remote control start on it. So. If you don't use it and it doesn't work and you took the fuse out and it fixed it, you may just leave it the way it is. We see a lot of cars oh. come in that are used and customers never even knew they had mm -hmm. a remote start on it. Um, some of them have the system set up where if you hit the lock button twice on your regular factory remote, it'll start the car up. And we've had people just freak out saying, my car started up by itself and it doesn't have a remote start. And we look and we find out, yeah, it had well, one. And they said, but it's never done this before. I've had it six years. Well, you never hit the button like that before. So yeah, it shouldn't hurt anything. And right now I would venture to guess if you take that to a dealership and tell them you just want the remote start pulled out, it's probably going to cost you a hundred to 165 bucks. And I don't know if it's working well, just he, fine. I think he was talking about talking about the remote start dealer and having them take it out. Well, either, either way, it's probably going to cost you yeah, at least it's money. You don't need to spend 60 bucks. So, you know, if you can, Producer, it, producer Doug stood up in the uh, control room in there when oh, we were talking about this problem, and he's like, "Yes, I've Prius. had this. Yes. <laughs> I've had this." He was, uh, he was, I was like, "Why is he standing up?" And then I'm like, "Oh, yeah, that's right. Doug had one that drove him crazy, and he had an old cheap remote start, and we removed that, and then he got a new one that worked. Right? You got the new one in the car? Oh, you never replaced it? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> You're freezing in the winter. But the uh, poor guy. You know, yeah, because all it takes is one thing to energize a module, you know, and and turn it on." When it's supposed to be in a rest state, and it'll start draining that battery down. But you are getting correct information. If yep. it were working fine, it wouldn't wouldn't yep. affect it. You know, speaking of remote starts, mine failed this morning. But you know what? I bought a good one from Audio Playground here in town. That's my go-to place, has been for a year. I used to work with the guys myself, and it's warrantied. So you kind of get what you paid for. <laughs> oh, nice. But it freaked me out. I mean, I had it running, and all of a sudden it just went doo -doo -doo, and shut off, and I went, I'm going on a 300 mile trip tomorrow. What just happened? And then I realized what it was. I had a discussion with my son the other day. Uh, Arliss, hang on. We're going to get to you after the top of the hour break. He said, you know, you have remote start in your car. And I said, no, no, I don't. He said, yeah, you do. I, I was using it. He was using it one day at work and he turned on, I have an AC button, which I didn't know started the entire AC system. I thought it was just to keep the car warm or cool inside and so i said no that's it it'll turn on the ac and it does it fires up the ac and the ac turns on remotely and it also will start the car if the battery's worn down enough it's the hybrid so it will turn on the ac under battery power but then once it gets low it will start the car so i kind of have remote start but it doesn't work as a remote start it only works as an air conditioner and turns the car on when it needs to turn the car on but that he was had, kind of a he, surprise. Had, he had figured that out yeah because he was using the air conditioning all the time you know he was soft. using it yeah totally absolutely. totally soft absolutely he is <laughs> that'll do it for this hour of the under the hood show next hour is coming up arliss we're going to talk to you right after we're done with the top of the hour break you can find us at under the hood show.com thanks for listening to this hour of the under the hood show you're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASC engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASC master certified technician. Extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Welcome to Under the Hood. Thanks for joining us here in the studio and stuff like that. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. 
He threw himself off there. Threw, I yeah. do that up. every yeah. time I do that. Welcome, I hoodies. Up. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. Thank you for the consistency. 866-594-4150. I'm Chris Carter here to take your calls. 866-594-4150. Now let's talk to Arliss, who's been waiting for a while. Arliss, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Hi, guys. I have um, a 2008 Jeep Wrangler with 70,000 miles. Um, no issues with the, the way the car runs, but it's had a several-year history of an intermittent uh, P0406 code, which is the EGR sensor circuit is high. And I checked the wire and didn't find any problems, eventually replaced the EGR valve, and it seemed to be okay for a while, and then began having the intermittent uh, 0406 code again, and it was becoming more frequent. And so I took it to an independent shop, and they said the EGR valve is working just fine, but the voltage is out of range. And they found a technical service bulletin from Jeep that said it's actually the computer needs to be reprogrammed because it has the wrong limit. So I took it to a dealer to get it reprogrammed this summer, uh, drove out to Moab and back, uh, you know, some, uh, out in Utah, put some miles on it. And then yesterday I get in and I get a P0405 code, the EGR sensor circuit A is low. Um, what do I do now? Oh, my. So I, we went I, from... I think I tune out because yeah. he sounds like he knows more than I do by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it over to Russ. Yeah. Russ? We went from... <laughs> Okay. I'm going to let Russ take this yeah. one. <laughs> it was checked, and they said it's fine. So hopefully it's fine. But then they found yeah. first it was high, then it was low. Well, that was after programming. So we either have one of two things going on. We either have, we really do, we still need a, a programming issue. There's something wrong when they programmed it. Not by the way they programmed it, but there's something in that calibration file that's not right. Or that EGR valve was bad. And it appears like it's right, but it's a little off. And after they reprogrammed it, it's showing its ugly problems. So you may need a valve, but you may need programming. So if they're certain that there's, I would first ask the dealership, tell them what happened. Tell them it did this for years. You reprogrammed it because of the bulletin. And now it's exactly opposite. Went from high to low. And see what they say. Because sometimes there's more than one calibration file. We'll go to download a lot of calibration files that'll say, use this file if this is occurring. Use this file if this is occurring. So they may look in their calibrations files and it may say, uh, reprogram engine PCM. And it says, use this file if... Uh, only if EGR reads low after programming for service bulletin, whatever. So that that may be in there, and they may they may know right away what that is. Now they'll have to do a little looking because typically the service advisor you will speak to does not have the knowledge of all those service bulletins in their head. Uh, they would refer it back to a technician who would be doing that programming, but that may be what it is. I'm, I've got a feeling you've either got a problem with the programming and they will have to do a different calibration file or the EGR could be bad. And in the worst case, your computer may have an internal problem. We've put a few computers in this body style Jeep for various sensor issues where they were lying to the, the computer was lying to us. It was giving us data that wasn't right, but we measure the sensor and it says like 10 and the computer says 12 and we go, wait a second. I'm looking at the sensor physically with my voltmeter, and it says 10. Why does the computer say 12? Does ever you dis discovering it just make it fix itself like it was lying and knew it was lying? And then and it goes, you, oh, <laughs> okay, I'll, gotcha. do it. I'll do it no, now. No, it just looks at us and goes, okay. ah, buy a new computer. All right, Arliss, you held on over the break, and I got to ask a question that just made me go, hmm. This hmm. Jeep, you said you drove out to Moab. How modified is this Jeep? Oh, not, not too much. I, I put it like a two and a half inch lift on it and steel bumpers, um, a winch, uh, but nothing radical. Okay. And okay. So that's why I was curious if it had any different performance Exhaust. upgrades done to it or anything like that. And now Better. we got to play a game since we, since you were patient enough to wait for us so long. This is a, 
He's got an 08 Wrangler. He's driving it to Moab. So he wants to get out and really use it like a Jeep, not a mall crawler like the one we had. So what color do you think his Jeep is, guys? Our list don't tell us. Okay. I'm, I'm going to guess that his Jeep is red. I'm going white. I'm going just like I liked your mall crawler. I thought that was a good-looking Jeep. It was white, right? Yeah, it was white. Okay. Yeah. It's black. It's black. Our list, what color is your Jeep? Yo, I almost bought a black one, but it's red. It's red. Oh, congratulations. I, well, I, could, I had a vibe going there on yeah. that one for some reason. Oh, I got lucky. Well, that's pretty cool. And, and was it fun out in Moab doing that? Oh, we had a great time. Yeah. Did, did you go out with a group or by yourself? Oh, by myself. Yeah, there is a, there's a lot uh, of people that go out that way and just experience the outdoors in their Jeep or whatever it might happen to be, and that's a, it's a culture, and there's, there's a ton of folks that do it, so good for you. Did you go for it, or did you just do a little bit and then go, oh, I wish I was here with a bunch of people and I could really go for it? Um, no, I, I don't do anything uh, too difficult. Like, if you know the trail system, about a level – Four trails about the most I will take on. Uh, what was kind of funny is um, my wife. Uh, my wife has a bad, me- bad memory because of a stroke, and we went up these hills where she said, "I never want to do this again." Uh, but then the next day she couldn't remember it. So we can go again. <laughs> Arliss, thanks very much for the call. She didn't that, laugh, but that's a good story. Good. Like 50 first dates. So yeah. Oh, you love roller coasters. I do? Okay. It sounds, uh, going out to Moab in a Jeep, doesn't matter what you do, it just sounds... Sounds cool. It sounds great. Arliss, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150 from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Now let's talk to Zach. Zach is in Missouri. Zach, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, guys. How's it going today? Fantastic, Zach. So what I've got is I've got a 2007 Mazda CX-7. I bought it as a gas getter because my main vehicle is a three-quarter ton Silverado that gets two miles to the gallon, I think. <laughs> so I bought this car as a gas getter, and uh, I've got a strange problem to where sometimes it's up sign. And oh, you're breaking up there a little bit, Zach. Sometimes. Go, hold on. Start over. Oh, sometimes. Sorry about that. When you start, start all over on that. Okay, can you guys hear me good now? Yeah. Okay, I'll quit walking around. So I'll be driving. Sometimes I'll stop at a stop sign, and it will just die. I will uh, shut the key off, turn it back on, it fires right back up. Recently, what it's decided to start doing is I will pull into a parking lot it will. I'll shut it off. I'll go out to start it. I get a no start condition, no click, no nothing. It will not start for hours. I will leave it. I'll come the next day, and it will start right back up. Puzzling. You're definitely saving gas. <laughs> would, oh, yeah. That would not, be not the answer he's looking like for. Miles a gallon right now. First of all, I just when he said Mazda CX-7, I went, "Oh, cool! It's a..." Oh, and then I remembered, not, no, not, not an R. RX-7. It's no, a it's CX. C. It's a little different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's that letter makes a big difference on the front. And the CX-7 is, I guess, not what I would call the ultimate gas saver, but in comparison to your truck, it is. Right. Which motor is in your CX-7? Yes, yeah, very much. I'm, Honestly, I'm ashamed to say this because I'm a, I'm a really big car guy, but this was literally bought for the gas purposes. Um, I think it's like a 2.3 maybe. It's a turbo four-cylinder. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's still pretty strong for the weight of the car, though. Yeah, that little turbo motor is good yeah. job, Russ. you got to go by, you know, horsepower weight ratio yeah, like yeah. a plane because in, in this car, so let's say this was a uh, 69 Chevelle with a, with a big block. That's a lot heavier car, almost twice the weight. 
So you could take about half the horsepower of that. You're you're not quite comparable. Yeah, you got yeah. the hatchback going there, the midsize hatchback. Yeah. But the, the problem you're having, though, is not related to any of the thing we're talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But the, the, I think yeah, so. the dying at stop signs could be partially related to this no crank, this complete no crank. I think you have a complete open circuit in either the power or the ground going to that battery. And it may be just a weak terminal. Those battery terminals are really cheap on those cars, the way they make the clamps work. You can grab a hold of it and move it at all. That end probably needs to be replaced. They're like a bolt-on type terminal on there, and you can pick those up. They, they'll sell them. Uh, that, that end piece on there, you just take the nut off and, and replace it. You can't put a universal one on with a clamp because you have to cut the wires, and there's just too many things going into that. Uh, that's why we, we pick those up at auto parts stores. Uh, get the right ones. Even if they're looking a little iffy, you'll want to replace them because they're just they're cheap cheap insurance for you but if you're if you've got a connection that's getting a little weak and there's a little corrosion inside where you can't see it you turn it off it doesn't start temperature humidity changes and then it makes a connection and it fires right up but if you lose that connection even while you're going down the road you come to a stop sign you get little fluctuations in the charging and things of the car and it can cause it to die on you and then it starts right back up it could be everything well, to do with just I that i don't know yeah, I went through and checked all my as many of the grounds and powers that I could get to. Um, I put it up on my lift, and we, I basically went underneath the whole undercarriage looking for it because it did seem like there for a little bit that maybe uh, humid conditions caused it more, but uh, I couldn't really find a major plug underneath there unless there's one I'm missing because I was hoping maybe I could find one that had some corrosion in it that may have had something, but all the connections I could find or, you know, even the battery terminals at this point, everything's still nice and you know, metallic looking. It's not corroded by any means. Everything's nice and tight. Um, the, I'm definitely feel like I'm looking for some kind of a plug that's got some kind of a weak connection to change the heat. Well, one th- that's the strangest thing. One thing you could try if, you know, the temperatures are still staying up right now, if it doesn't ever do it in cool weather, you know, if, as, as we cool down, you might try cracking a window or two when you park and see if uh, okay. letting some heat escape, if it doesn't oh, do it. Internal temperature. There could be a module in the fuse panel area or something to do with that That under that extreme heat. That, we had that problem with Hondas back in the day and some Toyotas even, I think, that they would, they would build ambient temperature up inside the vehicle with the windows closed, and it would make, the, I can't remember which module it was, but it was something on the fuse block that would make that module just short out, and it wouldn't continue the, the main send. relay was going yeah on. it wouldn't send the start signal and do you have other things that power okay, can up I ask you guys there what's that yeah so that's the thing whenever it whenever you turn the key on everything's there exactly how it should be it's it's just a no it almost acts like uh like an immobilizer system almost it's almost like it's saying hey you know you know i haven't shut off the alarm or something like that and it's just it's mm-hmm. everything's there it's just nothing happens if you don't have a theft light, you could get a uh, um, a push button for a start where you clip onto your starter and then oh, one just to the battery it. just to crank it and see if it'll crank and fire that way. Is that yeah, would be, it does have the anti-theft light. It does? Yes. If it's got an anti-theft light blinking when it's not starting, that's a whole other thing. That's not a connection issue. That's a problem. Well, let me say this. So... Yeah, whenever I turn the key on to the on position on yep. the days that it doesn't start, once I turn it on and, you know, your typical lights fade out, the the anti-theft light is not on there. I will say oh. this, it does have a remote start that is, I, I believe it's a factory. Under the hood it says, uh, you know, there has been a remote installed. It's got what looks like a separate Mazda key fob that's maybe an inch. By an inch, it's a really small key fob just for the remote start. Is a dealer installed the remote, the remote start? start. Doesn't. Yeah, the remote start doesn't work. So I'm just oh I'm trying to think of any any stuff I can give you guys. Yes, find that. That is a dealer installed remote start, and it does have a anti grind feature. So when you start it or the remote starter, and you get in the car and it's already running, you can't crank the engine. It shuts. It dis. It cuts the connection to the starter. So get under the dash, 
The dealer installed ones are usually not as pretty as the rest of the wiring, and you should be able to see where they've cut a wire and spliced it in or taken two plugs off and spliced it in, unplug it, plug the factory stuff back in or splice the wires back together and see if that fixes your problem. I, I, that's now that we've gone around to that part of the block, I, I, I bet that the starter kill portion of that remote starter, which is not working, is causing your problem. That makes perfect sense. Okay. There yeah. you go, Zach. Thanks so, very much for the call. If you don't use a remote starter anyway, we, Just, we had a call earlier. Mm-hmm. In his case, fuse out wasn't causing the problem. But if this is causing the problem, just get rid of it if you're not using it anyway. Zach, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Minnesota. Talk to Brian. You're on the end of the hood show. Brian, what can we do for you? Easy question for you. 2007 Ford, Ford Freestar, but I think it applies to a lot of Fords. The shifter goes PRND31. I can't figure out any way to hold second gear in this thing. Is there any hack that will make that thing hold second gear? New transmission. Uh, you mean like a... <laughs> no, no, there's nothing wrong with the transmission, oh, okay. but the I, shifter does not allow me... In all my GM products, it's D321. This is D31. Well, they oh. they actually thought it out and cared about their, their customers and, and that they wanted second gear. Um, well, this that's is, kind of the way I'm feeling about it. I don't want to drive this thing in the mountains. Yeah, there are a lot of manufacturers that have done that over the years in just certain models. And yes, you can put it in one... And hold it in one, but you can't hold it in two. So you've either got to slow way down and drive first gear speeds or drive it and drive, which is going to put you at 65 miles an hour coming down a big hill in the mountains. It's, yeah, it's absolutely worthless with that, with not having first gear. I was thinking of something gear. different. Yes. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's nothing. The only way you can control that would be is if you had a scanner hooked up and you commanded it to be in second gear. And it's not a, it's not an easy feat to do. We can do that with some of the higher end scanners we have, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to try to go in there and select second gear to get down the hill. I I've never had anybody say I'm going after a way to fix this, but I've had plenty of people over the years say I wish it would do it. Do you know a way around it? And I I don't. That's what I was hoping for. I knew you guys would know the answer. Oh, wish we had a fix for it. Though. Yeah, for sure. Living in Minnesota is a good way to deal with it, mostly. I mean, then you don't have to. Yeah. Not something you're dealing Typically, with. Typically, you're not in that gear needing to hold a hill. Right, right. Brian, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Tim. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Tim, what can we do for you? Tim, are you there? Oh, let me try this. Tim, are you there? No, oh, Tim is not there. Tim is there now. Tim is there. Tim, are you there? Tim is not there. I keep getting signals now. Let's try one more time. Then Tim's gone. I'm. This is it. I've had enough of Tim. Tim, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, this is Tim. I called a couple of weeks ago oh, okay. about a BM with a DPF. Yes. The diesel. Uh, yes. That was uh. You had yep. a son in the military, and you had a, a DPF problem, and you were trying to fix it and get by, and it had sentimental value, and right, that's the one. Yep, that is. And what it is is, I had the knock sensor. They replaced two of the knock sensors, and it cleared all the codes, Ha-ha. but the DPF. So I just wanted to thank you guys for oh, the advice. Great. It saved me a lot. But now my question is, how do I know? So I'm going to take the car out now that codes are all clear how do i know that it's i have cleared the dpf you know is there i'm going to run the engine at at 3000 rpms for a bit and see if i can get that how will i know i did it well once you once you get out and you have you won't but if the if the codes are gone that'll then then you know because it's run it and it's passed the test but you're going to have to get it up to operating temperature and then get it out on the highway for a while with the cruise on, so it it runs that test because it's a lot harder to run than you think. It do, it won't do it just holding it for short periods. You're going to have to really get some heat build up. And Go get for out a on trip. Take a little take a little drive with it. Yeah, but then once it runs, it should it should say cycle completed, no codes left. If if that's all you need. Go look on the internet for the largest thing around you and go take a look at it, like the largest fish or the largest. 
Bald Yard. eagle statue. Yeah, largest ball of, ball of twine. Yeah, exactly. Tim, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. You can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. 866-594-4150. From the autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Rick Marshall in Jackson, Mississippi. That's where he's from. Congratulations. Chris says that's all I can sing of that song, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Just, yeah, just say the word. That word. Everybody will hear it Don't if they know Don't bust it. out into mm -hmm. song. Just, it just cuts our feed right off. The it's good thing horrible. is I get to do that on my other show. I burst into song a lot. You can. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Show mm -hmm. tunes? Whatever. It doesn't matter. I, I, there's no filter. Whatever comes in. Have you busted into a show tune? Oh, yeah. This week, yes. You have? Oh, yeah. What Absolutely. show tune? Do you remember? I don't remember. Okay. It just happened. Mm -hmm. I think it was well. We can't sing it if organic. It was. I think yeah. it was Gary Indiana mm. that came up. All right. Anyway. All right. Well, <laughs> congratulations from all of us here and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. Universal Technical Institute is standing by to be your personal trainer. Mm -hmm. oh, hey, we could all use a personal trainer. Probably don't, but we could use one. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be personally trained to be the best auto technician, the best CNC machinist, welder. Marine mechanic, motorcycle mechanic, jet ski mechanic. The list goes on and on and on and on with opportunities for financial aid. Close campuses near you. Check out Universal Technical Institute, uti.edu, training you for the future. You made a comment on an, on an episode stuff. earlier, Russ, it that, that it was intriguing to me. It just it kind of it triggered me to think, hmm, there are people out there that have been involved in computer networking, IT work, uh, uh, electrical engineering type mm -hmm. stuff. They make are, good car mechanics. That are going to be very, very intrigued and very valuable to he jump into the electric car world. Mm -hmm. And they probably never thought of the automotive field before, but now the automotive field may interest them more because right. they're not thinking of it as the greasy, grammy type of stuff. Because when you think of, a, of an electric vehicle, you don't have that factor you know, you've got brake and brake dust. You've got, um, you know, tire wear and tire debris, a little bit of that. Um, but as, as a rule, you're going to have coolant because they're going to still use a lot of coolant to run through some of the electrical systems to cool them down. You're going to have refrigerant still of some sort in the air conditioning systems. But the oils are, are pretty much gone that make a lot of the mess. Yeah, a lot of, lot so of things just are different. A, it's just a different thought process for somebody that might think of entering gonna, the field. The shops are going to smell different. In a, they in will. Years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything will be, com wow, completely different. Uh, will it smell like when I used to overheat my electric race cars? I know we use those references too no, much. I don't know. I, for a broken one, is going to be like, well, like for instance, in the microwave? You can, you can be, Tesla's starting to have a few independent repair shops now because that's one of their biggest downfalls. People are like, well, I can't get my car fixed. I got to go to Tesla. They're letting you do that, but you have to have pretty much, I, from what I looked up, it's, you've got to have like your own dedicated shop. It's just going to do that. It's going to be clean. It's going to fix Teslas. It's not going to fix other cars as well. It's got to be separated. And, and that's great, but, you know. You better have a good population of those vehicles around you well, if you're going to venture into that. You know, you could. Or uh, concierge other than, tow service. Well, everybody that I know that has one around this area, and there's there's quite a there's few. There's quite a number of them in our Several area. hundred of them, but when I looked up the registrations on them. But the repairs, I, everybody that I know that has one, they, they've all said the same thing. I haven't had to have it repaired yet. Some of them have five or six years. You know, other than a few little nicks and scrapes here and there that needed some body work, they just didn't need any repairs. So I'm like, boy, it'd be like the Maytag mechanic. Well, one of the things that people are missing on on the cars is the uh, the brake slides need to be need to be lubricated, and that's not getting done on a lot oh, of people. Sure. Well, the so Teslas and even the Prius, a lot of those electric cars, they're they're using regenerative braking, so they use the electric motors to slow the car. So therefore, the brakes don't get used much. Don't wear out. Uh, the the time on brakes, the the estimated time on a brake repair on a Tesla is well over 150,000 miles when a normal car might be 30 to 
60,000 miles for a brake job. So, you know, if you're talking never changing the oil, never doing the brakes possibly for the there time There is a maintenance interval it. on those brakes, though, is where the point I was getting at. People don't, aren't doing it. There, are, to get there are things that if they did everything that needed to be done, you'd still be in the shop at least 5% of the time. Of Would the you record. believe me, Russ? And when you start something like that, it's going to be one of them statements that you would know the answer and you're just – but there's two uh, – No. There's two plaids in South Dakota already. Really? Oh, no kidding. Yep. The Tesla Model S plaids. Yeah. One it, was just wrapped recently in Sioux Falls. It's very interesting to look up its public information of how many cars, not who they're registered to, but how many cars are registered, which is pretty cool to find. And then I did find something on the national debt calculator the other day. There's a button, all those little buttons that nobody pays attention to. We found one, our guy in our shop, Jake was looking at it and he says, uh, oh, check this one out. Car sales by manufacturer year to date. Oh, wow. They were brutal. Oh, it's, it is brutal. I mean, like. Nothing. General Motors may lose their sales crown that they've had for 70-some oh, years go, for the first when you're, time. When we're done, go look it up if the Internet doesn't block it here. now, it probably does. But, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like, oof. 866-594-4150. Wow. Let's talk to Adam. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Adam, what can we do for you? I have a question. On Somebody told me you still on Chrome as far as the cattle guard and running boards. I was wondering what to use and... How much uh, cattle guards would be down in a few years? Okay, so a few years down the road. I just want to. Okay, so it's a, is it a steel? It, is a steel it, that's it, been chrome? Got a rustrator on the pipe. Okay, what well, we would all no. It's, the chrome has got because it's a 2015 Chevy Silverado, and it's got rustrator on the pipe. And I'm looking, wondering how much, what to use as far as to get the rust off. So I can save up for in a few years to get a new one. Well, if it's what I'm thinking of, and you're going to like my answer, it gets to be like a surface rust that kind of leaks leaches out of like where the welds are at and stuff like that, and then it gets on the surface of that steel chrome. Get some steel wool, zero zero zero, just the really fine stuff, and you can usually polish that rust right off of there if it's not too deep, and it'll take it right off the surface. And I- and, and and then I would just maintain it. Uh, I I don't I wouldn't plan on replacing that unless you've got a deeper rust problem than what I'm imagining. What I typically see is just a surface rust that just starts and leaches out of maybe a small pinhole in a weld, and some oxidization will pop out of that, and then it starts working around, or or salt and moisture will just he, form on the surface of that steel chrome. Once you get it off, can you do anything to keep it from happening again? I couldn't. I did it on my Volkswagen. I didn't. I using. I did the old. Uh, coke and tinfoil trick on one of the bumpers and it worked perfectly and then on the other one i used steel wool and it worked exactly the same it worked perfectly too but that it did come back after a season yeah. a little bit there is some products out there that are supposed to inhibit rust but i think they would have a hard time adhering to that shiny chrome surface i, I think this just just brushing it up every once in a while with that steel wool is going to be your best medicine adam thanks very much for the call good luck 866-594-41. I, I do want to say that's on a steel chrome surface. Mm-hmm. If, 5 I'm sorry I cut that off. I just because I, I wanted to jump back in while he was still there, but it, it, that's on a steel chrome surface. Don't use that on like a, a, a aluminum uh, surface that has a clear coat over it, like a wheel. Uh, it's got that. I'm talking about steel that has been chromed. I just want to be specific about that. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Bruce. You're on the end of the hood show. Bruce, what can we do for you? Well, good morning. Thanks for taking the call. I have a 2005 Ford Escape. I had the alternator replaced on July 5th. Uh, Last Thursday, uh, it was kind of rainy. I remember kind of driving through a puddle, and of course you guys know that alternator is on the bottom. And uh, I thought, yeah, you know, no big deal. Then the next morning when I got in, my battery light came on. All my gauges went wacky. And it didn't kill. It kept running. I drove it around for a few minutes, and I parked it and let it run. And I took it to my mechanic, and he said, well, that battery's charging at about 16 or 17 amps. It's going to blow up any second. So I went and got a new battery. Everything was fine. Yesterday, I washed it thoroughly under the wheel wells, everywhere. When I got back in it, that battery light came on again. I drove it about two or three blocks, parked it. I called the place that had replaced the uh, 
the alternator uh, back up in Minnesota. And while we're talking, I said, uh, is there a chance that when I unhook that battery that um, I asked about voltage regulator, and of course, that's in the alternator. And I said, now, if I hook that back up, will it kind of reboot? And apparently it did, because now it ran fine last night. I drove down to Elk Point this morning, no issues. But is that something I'm going to have to be concerned about driving down the interstate that all of a sudden it's going to fail from what I just said? Or is it a mystery or what? Well, that the computer controls that charging as well. So, yes, you, you could have a problem with that alternator. Those alternators are so difficult to replace that when it comes time to replace one, we put on OEM Motocraft alternators only. And people say, well, I want to buy the, the cheaper one because there's, you know, a 100 to $140 difference in the price. And I tell them, well, I, I hope you're not too offended, but if you'd like to get the cheaper one, I'd like you to find a shop to do that for you because I don't want to do it because I'm going to warranty it for a year, parts and labor with unlimited mileage, 100%. So, which means if it fails again, you don't pay a dime, but guess who pays a lot of dimes, hours of labor to do it a second time. So we're, we're going to use that better quality part because I've had so many problems with them. I, the ones that I use the cheaper ones on almost half of them, we had to put in again within a year. And I just, I don't, I don't like that. And sometimes they'll pay, those manufacturers will pay a warranty claim on them, but they're, they're almost nothing. So we choose to go with the better one right off. You may have an issue with your, with your computer. You're able to reset it by disconnecting the battery. That shouldn't reset the regulator in the alternator. Yeah, the alternator isn't going to reset. Mm, no. So I think you've got a problem with mm. the, and it could be two things. It could be either the, the computer's got an issue going on and now it may be fine or the wiring where it plugs into the back of the alternator, the smaller wire, which is a little white one, that has been known to get a little moisture in it and not make a good connection. And if it's not making a good connection, you may have to replace the pigtail right at the alternator because it could be causing all this issue. And make sure all the splash shields are in place mm -hmm. to make sure it's deflecting For sure. moisture and stuff away from that, that alternator. And right. I wondered about that when they replaced it. There's that shield that talks about Google it and all that. You know, there's supposedly a way you can work it out of there without pulling the transaxle and everything. But, um, mm. they, you know, they, they did it the right way. And then, and I, to be fair to the shop that's up in Minnesota, they said, you know, they would stand behind it 100%. And, um, and I said, okay, well, let me keep, keep doing some investigation. But that's my question is, you know, driving down the road, maybe just keeping my, uh, my eight millimeter uh, socket set with me. And if something happens, just unhook it and hook it back up and couldn't hurt again. <laughs> there you go, Bruce. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Now let's go to Wisconsin and talk to Derek. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Derek, what can we do for you? I've got an um, Audi 2019 RS3. And um, a while back, probably a month or two ago, had a flat with one of the rear tires. And instead of replacing the staggered tires on this at a pretty penny, I decided to, which... Uh, a lot of other guys do put 18 inch wheels instead of the 19s that are on it. The challenge has always been with this vehicle is, is that they are big six piston calipers in the front and the 18s, most 18s don't clear. Um, found a manufacturer that made them um, relatively inexpensively. Um, and I put those on there, um, new lug bolts that are conical. Um, immediately after driving it, had wheel or steering wheel vibration. And so we thought it was a balance issue. And part of it was that we thought that because there's little clearance on the wheels, the calipers, that, that it didn't balance well because those, you know, they're, even though they're using low profile wheel weights, that we still might be out of balance. So I actually took it to a different independent place because I couldn't get back into the dealer in time. And they, 
rebalanced them to no avail. Um, we ordered uh, poly um, hubcentric rings. Uh, that did not solve it. They road force balanced it, and we st I still have some vib. You know, it's it's enough vibration in the steering wheel. It's different. I I'm hearing that. Um, People are telling me I should still get instead of the poly, the you know the plastic rings. I should get metal. Other people are saying that's not going to do anything. Someone said you should be checking the alignment. I called an alignment place. They said that shouldn't be doing anything. It's still got to be a balance issue. Yeah, not a vibration. Outside of me getting my win yeah, outside of me getting my winter wheels, which I've I've got um, a set of 19 inch with winter tires on there. Not quite winter here yet, but. I know that those have been solid, so I'm, I'm getting those back and I'm going to put those on. But outside of that, what else could be wrong? I'm concerned that it's not necessarily a balance issue, especially after they took them off and put on a road force balancer, but something out of round. If you're feeling it in the steering wheel, it's got to be in the front end, so I'm, I'm going to want to have the car off the ground with the suspension supported, not the not the frame, so the control arms are hanging down, but I want the jack stands like under the end of the where the struts mount there towards towards the end of the control arms holding this thing up. And I want to rotate the front tires and watch the tread very carefully and make sure that it's maintaining a flat surface with the with the with the pavement at all times. If it hops up and down a little bit as it turns then it's a it's a tire or wheel issue like a bent wheel or a bent you know a tire that's got a broken belt in it i have seen them put a tire with a belt that's a little crooked on a road force balancer and balance it out uh, you could balance if a tire was square if you made one square or an egg you could balance it you could put the weights where it's going to balance it but when it contacts the road it's going to hop it's not going to be even so it's going to lift the tire and dip the tire and your wheel is going to go back and forth as you drive. So I want to physically look at the tire as I'm turning it and watch it, you know, hold a piece of chalk or a crayon directly under the tread where it's making contact just barely with a section of the tire and then turn it. Does it make a mark and then not make a mark and then make a mark and not make a mark? If it does, that tire is not round. The run out is off and that will, that will give you a, a heck of a, a vibration because I in my Camaro right now I've got the same thing with staggered wheels on that and they're expensive tires and I've balanced them a couple times and I can't get all the vibration out even though it's perfectly balanced because the tires now as they've aged they've started to just twist a little bit and they they hop they got a little bit of hop so at different speeds I feel it in the steering wheel and in the back end of the car and I can't do anything about it other than change the change the tire on the on the thing. So I'm, I, I bet you have a something that's either either the tire, and if it's not out of round, if the tire and wheel are not out of round, but it's still moving up and down, you've got a hub that's bent on the on one of those on the front because it's in the steering wheel. So that's, that's what we'd look for. You can balance them until you're blue in the face. I don't think that's going to fix it. I think you've got something out of round. Okay. And, that's, and they have moved the front to the back, and the, the challenge always is there is that the – you know that you may in your Camaro, you may know, but like in this, the calipers in the, oh, yeah. in the back are nowhere near as challenging as the front. I mean, there's there's millimeters between there. Well, they're monsters. They have to use the little profile. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's um, the hard part. So when I when I moved it from front to back, it did not it 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 didn't change anything. So I, mean, I don't want to mention any names, but the place that I've gone to has gone above and beyond what they should have had to do. And he said the next step. Because they'll warrant, even though they didn't sell the tires, they're they're a a, a dealer for that tire. Um, said that they will, you know, work with them to replace the tires if need be. Um, but they didn't want to have to go that step if if necessary. So I guess when I put this other set on, um, we're gonna we're gonna pinpoint this as whether it's a vehicle issue or it's a if you put tire and wheel. You put those winter tires on. If the problem's gone then stick that tire on a stick those wheels on a balancer and just spin them by hand and watch the tread and see how much run out you have because i've seen when people are looking for a balance issue i've even done it myself i've gone I'm like it's got to be a balance issue and then i look at the tire and go oh 
well, that tire is moving up and down more than it should. There's my problem. And I, I think because it's small that it's not an issue, but it's, it's causing the issue because it doesn't do it with the other tires. And the bigger the tire you get, the less out of round it takes to cause the shake. You could have a very big bounce on Chris's Prius, but you may notice it in the Audi with that tiny little, little bit. Derek, thanks very much for the call. I feel pretty good about that answer there. I feel like you, you Vibrations, gotta... most people put up with them. If you're driving a Chevy Impala and it gradually gets bad over time, you just go, oh, I never really noticed. Yeah. And then you fix it and they go, oh, yeah, it is better. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Daryl. You're on the end of the hood show. Daryl, what can we do for you? Hey, I have a question. Uh, 2006 F-150. Um, I forgot the size of the motor. Is that 5.3? Probably 5. a 5.4. 5. 4. Uh, 5, 5. 4. That's right. Okay. Um, cam phasers. Um, now, mine haven't gone out yet. Uh, it's an 06. They only have about 85,000 miles on it, but I understand they tend to go out after 100,000 on that. So what can I do to stop that from happening, if possible? And then I was looking at... Uh, that information online, and they were saying something about you can lock out those cam phasers. You can. Um, we just did that, one. Should it be done? Well, we just did one. It's there's no need to do it until they until there's a failure. But it's not the cam fa- phaser that's failing. It's the engine failing that doesn't allow enough oil pressure to reach the phaser, which makes it not operate like it should. And, it, and eventually, if they get bad enough, they'll damage the right. phaser. We saw. The, when we did the lockout kit on one two weeks ago, we saw damaged phasers. And this person had been running this thing with those phasers clacking and rattling for a year and a half. And that's so it didn't surprise us that they were damaged. So we had to replace the phaser and lock it out, which was kind of pointless because we had to spend the money on a brand new phaser where we could have saved the old one and just put the kit in it. But the kit worked fine. Uh, the kit we use now is 50 state emissions legal, so we had no problem putting it in using their tuner to program it, and it worked perfect. I mean, it it had more power than it did before, so we were plenty happy with it. But if it's working good, there's no reason to do anything to it now, and you can ke- keep your engine protected if you use good quality engine oil in it and good quality filters and keep it changed on a good interval where you don't get that oil really dirty, the engine life will be greatly extended. Uh, we use oil from our partner, Liquamali, quite often now. We're having some people start asking about it by name, and it's been a, a very good quality oil. And I think if you just you run a good quality oil in there for, to keep the protection of the engine up, it's going to last you a long time. We've seen some of our customers with 300,000 miles on one of these, some with many less. Daryl, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Until next time, you can find us at underthehoodshow.com. Thanks for joining us.